So while this loads up, uh, my name is Satish Chandra Prakasan. I'm one of the interventional cardiologists. I practice mainly in the DFW Metroplex area. Um, this is an interesting case, um, and keeping along with the theme of an ST elevation MI. Unfortunately, I don't have a happy ending here, so heads up. Um, Subjectives so mainly is uh, to identify some of the nasty things and complications that can happen with uh, acute myocardial infarction and understand the role and limitations of what you can do with circulatory assist devices when things go wrong, especially in the setting of cardiogenic shock. And some of the rare things, you know, I've been in practice three years and this is my first encounter with such a uh, disastrous complication, but I uh, just wanted to share this experience with you all and see if anything else could have been done different. So this is a 60-year-old gentleman with no prior cardiac or any medical history for that matter. He was found down by uh, emergency personnel after his wife alerted 911 uh, because he was um, uh, unresponsive. Uh, they found him um, in ventricular tachycardia, pulseless, uh, shocked him twice, gave him epi, return of uh, spontaneous circulation after a prolonged CPR, 30 minutes. Um, and upon uh, interviewing his wife, he had complained of some chest pain the night before he went to bed, somewhere around 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. But, you know, just like an average American would do, just go to bed, and that's what we do in Texas. Um, so this EKG, pretty uh, obvious, pretty extensive anterior wall MI uh, labs, pretty decent. Troponin was not very high. Um, so I got the call. I was the uh, um, um, pretending on call. So, you know, interestingly, with all this uh, things going on, uh, they were able to get him back with just a couple of rounds of epi. As you can see, his vital signs were pretty decent. And I was told that he was given some ketamine uh, prior to arrive, so a neurological exam was not uh, possible, but although um, just as our ED protocol uh, suggests, we always get a CT in such situations to make sure there's no intracranial bleed, um, and uh, this patient also also in pulmonary edema as suggested by the x-ray, uh, but really nothing focal on the exam because those would be patients that I would uh, really hesitate taking them to the lab. I don't want them um, you know, having more uh, neurological issues. So at this point, a decision had to be made. Um, uh, I, I consider uh, myself as a little aggressive. A lot of patients, a lot of my at, um, uh, attendings would uh, even consider uh, the CPR time being a little bit prolonged, but uh, given the patient had persistent uh, ST elevation and uh, a relatively younger patient, uh, I decided to proceed with emergent uh, angiography with plans of uh, initiating um, hypothermia protocol. So here are his images. Uh, I'm going to play them, and I'm going to let them loop for you. So pretty, pretty typical uh, Widowmaker lesion. Uh, here's his right, um, and uh, pretty straightforward uh, uh, from an anato anatomical standpoint, and I've seen some of the presenters earlier present some complex uh, anatomy, but this was fairly straightforward from an uh, intervention standpoint. Uh, we were able to resume uh, restore flow in the LED, but as you can see, something's missing in the uh, lateral wall, so I decided to proceed with uh, wiring the diagonal. My aim was to restore flow, uh, stent the LED, uh, get the heck out of there. Uh, I'm a minimalist, I try to keep it simple. Um, so all that I did was to wire the diagonal, uh, make sure there was flow in the diagonal. And this was after the uh, LED stent with two overlapping 25 by 38 and 275 by 34 on extra coded stents. Uh, pretty uh, satisfied with the results, Timmy 3 flow. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that uh, this patient, at this time, uh, I just want to make sure that when I opened the um, uh, diagonal branch, the patient acutely became hypotensive, and I attributed that to just uh, you know the reflow and everything. So I didn't make much out of it. But my decision changed once I did the uh, LV gram. And I do want you to pay a little bit of attention to this because this has a lot of implications to what, are the, what I'm going to present for the rest of the case. Um, as you can clearly see, the LV function is significantly reduced. There is inferior wall that's being uh, preserved. But the anterior wall is sort of disconnected and you can also see that the apex is also a little dyskinetic. And uh, as far as I can tell, at this point, I did not see any reason not to proceed with a support device. I did not see any other shunt. I did not see LV thrombus. I did not see a free wall perf. Um, as far as I was concerned, this patient, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I was done with my part in the lab. Um, so at this, pa at this point, the patient was adequately anticoagulated with heparin, and uh, we had given him some agrostat uh, because there was some thrombus in the um, uh, diagonal branch. So you know, we're all uh, getting ready to um, leave, this, uh, leave, the, uh, leave the lab. Um, 
So like I mentioned, this patient had um, a little bit of perioperative hypertension, and given that his LV EDP was high and presumed low cardiac output, and you kind of run through your uh, differentials at this point and make sure that uh, the patient's uh, hemodynamics are adequately supported. So, um, you know, I was taught by my um, program director when I was in training, your best support is to have a contralateral five front sheath, and which I did have, and it probably came in handy in this situation because after I realized that his LV EDP was high and he has significant uh, dyskinetic LV, I decided to place a, uh, a hemodynamic axial, uh, axial pump. Uh, so an impella CPY of 14 French uh, was placed after ensuring adequate iotoiliac um, anatomy. A patient was stable, uh, you know, we were getting good outputs, good arterial tracings, and you know, this is one of the roller coaster moments. You're thinking you're right up there and ready to get out of here, and then God has other plans. So uh, at this point, we're suturing the sheets, ready to get out of the lab, and suddenly the patient loses pulse, goes into electrical mechanical dissociation. And I was seeing a, one of the case presentations yesterday. Um, they called it the mother of all pericardial tamponades. Here's another one. Um, so at this point, you know, a couple of things run through your mind um, at this point. This is four in the morning. Uh, whether you wait for the, you know, we got, we were fortunate to get a stat echo at this point because the echo tech was somewhere around. But just from a decision-making standpoint, EMD in a setting of a STEMI is, is not, nothing to think about. I think the decision uh, for a pericardial synthesis has to be made right away. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have the imaging, and we were fortunate enough to uh, get the tamponade uh, relieved. And there was immediate improvement in the um, uh, hemodynamics. The patient's blood pressure improved, uh, and I was able to just uh, wean him off slowly off pressors. Um, and we had ordered um, uh, blood for transfusions, and I was also after transfusing. Uh, given that he had um, an anterior ST elevation MI with thrombotic burden, I elected not to give protamin at this point, and we started making some phone calls at this point to our um, um, loving cardiac surgeon. Unfortunately, he was not my preferred one, but I had to work with whoever was on call. Um, so we also managed to make sure there was no other mechanical complications. Here are some of the transthoracic and apical views. I was particularly concerned about other mechanical complications, uh, and also worried about the fact that the impala was in there. I wanted to make sure there was no other uh, iatrogenic complications. Uh, but all that we could see is a small hemopericardium with the uh, relief of the tamponade. Uh, no other mechanical complications that I could appreciate. And I've looked at this echo a number of times even after the case was done and the impella position was acceptable. Um, so what next? So at this point, um, the hemodynamics are improved, but the patient still, you know, as I'm continuing to aspirate the pericardial drain. It's not stopping. So there's no way that we can take care of this. This is clearly a surgical problem. And here's one of the other uh, uh, challenges that we had. It's four in the morning, and you have your on-call surgeon. And uh, you tell them the story, hey, out of hospital cardiac arrest, 30 minutes, pupils, not reactive, but he was given some sedatives. And we had to uh, kind of convince the cardiac surgeons and anesthesiologist. So the cardiac surgeon was very smart. He actually told me, well, I'll come in if the anesthesiologist is ready to take this case. And uh, so the battle was between me and the anesthesiologist trying to convince. This is a young guy, and um, our only chance, I mean, there's a great possibility that he's not going to make out of this hospital alive, but we've got to give the best shot. So I managed to convince them after probably an hour of dilly-dallying, but he was taken to the operating room. And I actually accompanied the surgeons and the anesthesiologist um, wheeling the patient into the uh, OR. Unfortunately, I don't have pictures of the actual um, surgery, but it was something that I would never forget in my life. Uh, the moment they opened the chest, you could see that spurting of the blood right at you. And it was a very short and quick surgery. I mean, the surgeon was able to immediately identify it was in the uh, infralateral wall. He rendered a primary suture. We didn't have to do any pericardial patch or anything. And I had one question for my surgeon. Can you tell me if this is free wall rupture from a uh, acute MI, or is it my impella wire or um, uh, catheter migration? He wasn't quite sure. He didn't give me a specific answer, but I assumed that it wasn't me. 
So I knew it wasn't me because I'm going to tell you why. Um, um, this is an intra-op PE, as we all uh, always do in all of our um, 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 cardiac procedures. So you could see a little bit of MR, which is sort of expected in this scenario. Uh, but um, I couldn't see any other shunt. Again, I keep mentioning that we particularly look for this. And our uh, uh, cardiac anesthesiologist was also uh, particularly interested in noting if there was any other uh, mechanical complications. So at this point, the LV dysfunction is still there. Uh, no significant pericardial effusion enough. We repaired the LV perforation. There's mild MR. Again, you know, I'm again, I'm, I thought I got him. I thought I had a chance again. And again, God always has other plans. Uh, so at this point, uh, we actually removed the Impella CP in the OR. And as you all know, the Impella CP has a uh, retrievable uh, port where you could wire and actually put in a 14 French sheet. So we were able to, uh, and I, I asked for as my knowledge goes, um, I'm not sure how Impella is beneficial when you have a free wall perf, but I was not comfortable removing the Impella in the midst of everything else going on. But anyway, this patient um, was uh, um, taken back to the CVICU, but unfortunately, uh, it wasn't just his heart then. He started bleeding through the ET tube, and uh, critical care tried to manage it with the uh, bronchoscopy, double lumen ET tube, and then, you know, things just um, um, uh, didn't work out for him. As you can see, the pH was pretty horrible. He again went into uh, PEA arrest. CPR did not work. Uh, he was um, yeah, pronounced uh, to be uh, expired. So here's the interesting part. And I did not know about this until for a day after the patient uh, passed away. This was an echo that was done right around the time between he was wheeled out of the OR and, and uh, he, he died. So I can't exactly tell you when it was done, because I only read it the next day. Uh, and this was surprising to me because my fellow goes like, hey, hey, did you talk to Chandra? Did you get to see this echo? It's like, oh, yeah. Um, so here is that mechanical complication that I was looking all along for. You know, we looked it for immediately after the pericardial synthesis. We looked for it in the OR during the uh, free wall rupture, um, and it wasn't there. So this happened right around the time that he was wheeled out of the OR and between the time he died. So this is ventricular septal rupture. Um, so the exact location, I'm, I'm kind of, and I've had uh, uh, some of my colleagues look at this, and they've given me uh, different kind of answers. In this view, it looks it's pretty close to the base of the septum, although it would be unlikely with an anterior MI. Uh, historically, they have a free wall perf uh, and or, or a VSR that is pretty close to the apex. Um, in this short axis view, again, you can see that the um, there is a, um, a connection between the, um, uh, there is the free wall, free wall uh, there is the interventricular septal rupture, and then you can see that confirmed by the Doppler um, over here. Again, the red arrow marks for your, uh, for your references, your, uh, uh, the ventricular septal defect. So, so in, in conclusion, you know, this was uh, one of those unfortunate scenarios, both for me and for the patient. Um, um, massive MI that was um, complicated by both electrical and mechanical complications, including shock, free wall rupture, and ventricular sept uh, septal rupture. So, and I, I only became aware of this cons of this entity called DMR or double myocardial rupture for the first time after I encountered this case. So I thought this was a very good learning experience for me. I don't have much literature on this because it was a bunch of case reports, uh, case series, that's all I managed to find. And as I uh, understand that this is a very rare scenario and it is only present in 0.3 uh, percent of acute MI cases, and, and these are all autopsy series. I don't think you're going to find these patients uh, um, in, your, um, in your regular um, um, uh, scientific literature. Um, one of the questions I always uh, ask or I worry about it for the week after this is whether uh, the impella uh, had anything to do with this, either the wire or the impella migration. And we actually had the abiomid rep with us uh, at the time of the procedure. You know, always they watch that it's not their device. Um, and as far as the literature goes, if you have a, um, a free wall rupture, perhaps an intra aortic balloon pump is a better support device as opposed to an impella, although these is not supported by uh, rigorous scientific uh, literature. And, and the question always comes is like whether this ventricular septal rupture was there all along, and we did not detect it because we did not do an LAO projection of the uh, uh, heart during the LV gram. Perhaps 
perhaps might have been a better idea. Uh, one of the things that I learned after this case is you could actually identify a ventricular septal rupture in the RAO projection if you pay close attention to the pulmonary artery opacification. There is near simultaneous opacification of the pulmonary artery in the aorta if you have a hemodynamically significant ventricular septal rupture. So uh, did you go back and look? I went back and looked. You know, I went back and looked all the pictures, and I, I, I can refer you back to my LV gram that I showed you. As far as I can tell, and in my, uh, you know, we, we've presented it in the morbidity and mortality meeting in our local uh, and, and hospital. This, and this was a proximal VSE, not distal VSE, as we see with the... Echo shows it's more like a basal, basal. close to the basal VST. Um, and then, so, uh, and, and the other thing I... It's not a typical LADVSD, right? LAD no, it wasn't. And as far as uh, 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 my literature yeah. shows goes, it's they are more close to the apex. If they have an uh, anterior MI, this was more close to the base from the echocardiogram. Again, that was just a transthoracic echocardiogram that was uh, uh, giving us the idea. And uh, historically, these patients don't do very well, despite the best efforts that you can give. I mean, uh, it was unfortunate. Um, one of the challenges I had uh, in dealing with this entire scenario of having to deal with the case myself and with so, the surgeon. So, so let's open for discussion. I sure. think we were, sure. you're twice as much your time. So uh, comments from the panel. So I'll just mention, um, just out of interest, that I saw a case that was somewhat similar to this a number of months ago. Um, and it involved an RV free wall rupture and a VSD. And that patient expired as well. And obviously, it's a very disastrous scenario. There's very little you can do to help. But um, similarly, the imaging was very challenging to actually find what was going on. It was missed a couple of times before it was finally detected. Um, and then I think otherwise, the other comment I was going to make actually was whether or not you got an opportunity to send them for autopsy, because with that case, we got gross path and histology. It was very interesting. That particular patient had a very fatty RV free wall, actually, and they were saying that it sort of took the path of least resistance or something like that. No, so we did not perform an autopsy. Uh, as per the patient's family wishes, um, they preferred not to perform autopsy. For so sure. I wish we did, but uh, yeah. Yeah, a couple of comments. So the, the post-MI um, rupture is, it's a complex thing, and often the path is very serpiginous. Serpiginous. In fact, it can be the same, it could be extension of the same defect that goes through the septum and through the free wall over time. And, and it could very well be um, that removing the impella, which was de decompressing the LV, really, it's maybe it's keeping the intraventricular sure. pressure down and the surgeon has just put sutures in. The sutures can rip, the thing can extend. There's, it's basically hamburger that's just infarcted. And so it, it's hard to know the timing, but it's predictable that it would extend. It's predictable that it can go into the RV, like in that example, or um, through the RV free wall or into the, out the free wall of the left ventricle or th across the septum. The location is a little bit weird. We've it's often, that looked like sort of a wraparound, wraparound LED. It's often at the end of that wraparound, sort of apical, but it can track up toward the base a little bit sometimes in, in an LED one. Um, it's very, I don't, I don't, the only question I would have is, you seem to have questioned it yourself, but how did you cross the valve to put in the impella? Uh, we always use a pigtail. Yeah. Uh, the pigtail, and then we use the uh, wire. That the tip of the wire is uh, curved. It wasn't like you crossed with a straight wire. No, and no, pushed no. It hard we, we don't like ever that. do that. You know, despite this so being an acute scenario, always I, use. As you can see, the uh, LV gram was performed within uh, LV. So, you know, at the end of the day, I felt happy that some of the things that I did at least made me yeah. feel better but that the, uh, I did everything possible. The, the time course was uh, very early, and usually, unless you give thrombolytics, uh, usually these are late complications. So probably right. the patient was infarcting for a while. Yeah. That's a great point. The, yeah, That's a great had point. The, had the arrest, and, uh, and then by the time he was brought in the hospital, probably two, he would have been infarcting for two or three days. Because this is a delay that you know, usually occurs between three days and two, and two weeks after an MI. So, you know, it's, uh, I mean, these are humbling experiences uh, that Absolutely. we all face in our, li in our professional life. Any, any comments, Moses? No, I, the only thing I would say is that, you know, you, I, I believe you definitely did what you could. There was like, the whole thing was heroic effort in the sense of, I don't know many people, like after 30 minutes of CPR, dilated pupils, they will go all the way to, to, to try. So, um, you know, the result was unfortunate, but uh, definitely not your fault. Yeah, that was a challenging decision to make, but at the time, you know, we had to do what, what I thought was best for the patient. Thank you so much okay, for that. Well, thank you so much, Satish, and uh, I'm sorry that the case turned out that way. <laughs>